So here we have, we start with painting. We look at painting um, where it's graduated from cave painting to the canvas painting. And in the year about uh, 1441 uh, was the introdu introduction of the lens. Um, and so once people started using magnifying glasses and spectacles, they understood that vision could be corrected. And in combination with the camera obscura, they started to recognize that an image that was projected on the wall in combination with the lens was a lot sharper and clearer. And so we get more accurate perspective here. We get curvature of, of the body, the human form. We um, see a progression of an image starting in about year 1440, about a year before the lens was uh, widely uh, spread. Uh, the, the plane is very flat. Um, the, it's pretty accurate in the human form, but it doesn't really go back into space. And the second one shows a, an image from about 1430, progressing to 1440 from left to right. Uh, the next one is about 1500, I'm sorry, 1300, then 1350, and the last one is 1625. So you can see in the progression that the ability to render armor, which is a very solid uh, metal form and and also very reflective, difficult to render just simply from the mind's eye and the memory, um, but with the aid of an optical device such as a lens, uh, artists were able to capture the curvature of the, the armor, the reflection of the armor, all the way to the very finely detailed um, engravings that are marked on the armor that you can see in the right hand image. The images started to become much more three-dimensional. Um, shape and volume was much more defined and could be seen um, to replicate how we actually understand space when we look at things. Two painters we've been talking about are Caravaggio uh, on the left and Vermeer on the right. Um, we see especially with lenses and, and the use of camera obscura, we have this dramatic change from lights to darks, um, making the forms seem very three-dimensional, very realistic. And so with the aid of a lens, painters were able to accomplish such realistic paintings that Caravaggio was actually uh, sort of reprimanded for using poor men and, and beggars from the street as models because the, the Pope recognized them. Uh, so he was able to, to paint so accurately, um, and it's, there's been research that shows that he was one of the first people to use a light-sensitive uh, underbase using particles from uh, lightning bugs in combination with different chemicals, where he was able, using the camera obscura, a lens, and the light-sensitive base, technically the first photographer um, to capture uh, sort of the imprint of the image and then go back and paint on it. Uh, Vermeer, on the other hand, um, doing again the same uh, camera obscura with a lens. Here we compare the two. On the left, Caravaggio shows much more biblical, um, allegorical type scenes um, because he's p p uh, commissioned by the Pope. So the images that he makes are for the Pope's purpose of teaching um, Christianity and, and lessons of the Bible. And so uh, hiring the artist, the artist then, the subject of what he paints is determined by the person who pays it. Right. So in other words, this is early version of commercial uh, artwork, or we could even say commercial photography. Vermeer, on the other hand, is showing much more vernacular scenes, scenes at home, scenes where people are doing everyday things, um, gathering the eggs, pouring the milk, playing the piano, having music lessons, playing cards, gathering with people. Um, we can see evidence of the optical devices seen on the, the reflections um, and what's called depth of field, where the foreground and the background start to go out of focus because of the the lens and the size of the opening. So we have the, the main players in photography. Um, we start with 
really four main players. The first one on the left, Joseph Nisifor Nieps, the was the man who was able to capture a permanent image. Um, he was able to, to actually make the print, come up with the idea of putting together uh, something that would make an imprint and, and last beyond just the projection through the camera obscura hole. So he was able to make the permanent image. Daguerre, the second man, um, was able to come up with the formula that could be written down and then repeated over and over by anyone to continue and achieve permanent photographic images. So he made it a process. He made it something that um, people could buy the materials, people could um, accomplish the technique, understand exposure, and capture a photograph. This image that replicated uh, how we saw exactly. Third man, an Englishman, uh, William Henry Fox Talbot, uh, working around the same time um, coming up with the, the calotype. And then we have the fourth guy, Hippolyte Bayard, who was working with Daguerre and um, was kind of backstabbed. So first we see uh, Nieps here, who was the first to, to combine um, printmaking techniques with the idea of photography and being able to etch the sun's image onto a plate that then could be repeated. He was able to accomplish this and by working together actually as a partnership with Daguerre um, was able to pass on the, te the, the technique of capturing the image and then Daguerre was the one who discovered that mercury vapors would develop the image much more quickly and uh, much more accurately to where you can actually see the smallest and finest details um, in a daguerreotype. William Henry Fox Talbot had been in, in some correspondence with Daguerre. Um, they had shared some information, but T Talbot was working as early as 1834 uh, with his calotype process. He went on to uh, publish what's called the Pencil of Nature using the calotype, where he was the was the man who decided that um, it, photography was in a way an art, an art that it was the combination of God's hand um, with light and nature and um, physical objects and the mind of man who through science and chemistry was able to combine those two into what would be an artwork. Um, so we have him laying down the ground here that photography is the pencil of nature or that in other words the hand of God, something more perfect that what, than what man alone could achieve. Hippolyte Bayard um, was also, he was a partner to Daguerre just before, prior to publication of the Daguerreotype process in 1839. Bayard um, was promised by Daguerre to have a sort of a piece of the pie, um, to be credited as a partner uh, in the development of the process. However, uh, Daguerre, uh, in exchange with the French government and his friend and lawyer uh, Arago, um, they published the process before Bayard could get any credit. So in, in essence, Daguerre backstabbed Bayard. So Bayard, wanting to undermine Daguerre in a way or get back at, um, well, what, what it comes down to is that Bayard's feelings were hurt. Um, so here we see a self-portrait of him as a drowned man um, because he was challenging the photographic truth or what Daguerre was claiming is the gift to the world um, that people were now able to capture nature as it is. However, he discovered photography could manipulate the truth. Uh, we see an example on the right where he uh, experimented with um, composite images and layering images and questioning sense of gravity and understanding of, of occupation within space where we see these floating uh, plaster figures.